Dear participants to this lunch webinar, a very warm welcome. My name is Pascal Pichona, and as president of the European Law Institute, it is a great pleasure and my privilege to welcome you all to this webinar on the occasion of the publication of the European Law Institute principles on blockchain technology, smart contracts, and consumer protection, which were approved by the ELI membership on the 8th of September 2022. This project had been launched several years ago when blockchain and smart contracts were words we knew about, but for which the lawyers had not yet a clear idea of what these con concepts were exactly about. First, Professor Chef Van Erp, Emer uh, today Emeritus Professor of Civil Law and European Private Law at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, and Juliette Seneschal, Professor at the University of Lille in France, were designated as co-reporters of this project. Later, the uh, European Institute added another co-reporter in the person of Dr. Martin Hansel. He's an attorney at law and head of the new technologies at EY Law Austria. And Professor Van Erp was then promoted to chair of this project. And on January 2021, Juliette Seneschal decided to step down as a reporter. When a little bit uh, than more than a year later, the final principles were presented to the ELI executive and the ELI council, they had been extended from the original ambit, given that the EU Commission had expressed its great interest in the project overall, but also had asked whether the most challenging issues of uh, consumer protection could also be addressed. And I think it has been a very important and justified move by the reporters and of course by the European Law Institute to agree to extend the initial project to cover these aspects, because these are of course central aspects given that, of course, the uh, treaty of the fun functioning of the European Union uh, requires a very high level of protection of consumers, and no one wants that the new technologies, and especially smart contracts, would put that high level of protection into jeopardy. The question is, Overall, however, very central, given that the estimated global blockchain technology market size is for 2030 uh, assessed as high as 1.5 trillion euros. By comparison, the global pharmaceutical manufacturing market size is expected to reach only, if I may say so, 1.2 trillion euros by 2030. This shows importance, which those principles adopted by the LI membership may have to help structure this market. To discuss the content, the challenges those principles had to face and the answers they give, we have a fantastic panel of speakers. I will have the pleasure to present them as we go along. But before we begin, let me remind you, of course, those who uh, listen uh, to these webinars more often no, but the others might be interested to know that the chat function has been disabled so that all your questions can be posed to our panelists but through the Q&A function, which is the proper function for those uh, questions, of course. And do not wait until the end, of course, to ask your question, to pose your questions, given that uh, during the webinar already, we might uh, see your questions and the panelists might even be influenced in what they say by your questions. Let us now start with our panelists. We will first, of course, begin with our two co-reporters and, and chair. And of course, I will hand over first the words to and uh, the floor to uh, Chef Professor Chef Van Erp. As I said, he's an emeritus professor of civil law and European private law at Maastricht U University. He is also the president of the International Association of Legal Science and a member of the American Law Institute. Uh, he has been a founding member of the European Law Institute as well as its former vice president and uh, as I said, from the beginning, 
he was the co-reporter and a, a very central driving force of these principles. On the other hand, or, or maybe other side of the screen, you have Dr. Martil Hansel. Uh, he's an attorney at law and, as I said, head of new technologies at EY Law Austria, Pelzmann, Gal Gross, Ressanwelte, GmbH. And previously, he worked at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. He has a PhD from the University of Vienna, where uh, he wrote his uh, thesis on the legal implications of blockchain technology. And since then, of course, he has continued to publish in this field books and articles. And of course, uh, obviously, with such a knowledge, he's also advising his clients in these areas. So I'm really thrilled with these two co-reporters to, to uh, uh, hand over the word to uh, Chef Van Erp to see what they want to carve out, because of course we will not be able to cover all the principles, but the main aspects and what are the challenges. Chef, you have uh, the floor. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you for your for your kind words. Um, Martin and I are going to present the principles in tandem. So I would like to ask Martin to share his screen. Um, and uh, uh, what I will do is I will make a few opening remarks. Um, then Martin will take over and focus on the first part of the principles, and I will focus on the second part, which is the consumer part. Uh, just a few opening remarks. Now, when you work on a project like this, you have to balance on the one hand that um, when you uh, look at the technological developments, you see that things are developing extremely rapidly. So what you consider to be a relatively small project becomes a huge project. And so somehow you have to narrow it down. So you have to understand that it's extending, you have to broaden it up and you have to, at the same time, you have to narrow it down. So what we tried to do is um, we were as abstract as necessary, but as concrete as possible. So both. Um, you can see that we try to be as abstract as possible. So in a way, broaden up in part one and as concrete as possible. So narrow it down in part two. So when we focus on consumers um, as an example of weaker parties. Um, as to the uh, impact of the project outside, let's say, blockchains and smart contracts and consumer protection, as you now find in the principles, um, uh, an example of the use of blockchain is, for instance, uh, the development of NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Now, um, I think this project could be a very good basis for further analysis of NFTs, but in a way that would be broadening up, but you have to narrow it down as to uh, the use of NFTs. Uh, the ULC in the United States has just begun a project on tokenization of real estate. And as part of that project, NFTs might, might play an enormously important role because uh, a token relating to real estate has great value. And it must be absolutely clear that it is this one token that is traded or transferred and not a copy of that token. Um, so I think this project really is a really good base basis for further development, um, looking at the well how blockchains are used. But in this pro project, we focused on the more general questions. So can a transaction on a blockchain as such be relevant or not? How do smart contracts work? What do we think about smart contracts from a legal perspective? And then focusing on weaker parties and particularly consumers. But as to the more general questions and the commercial side of blockchain, it's a pleasure to hand over to my co-reporter, Martin. Martin. Thank you so much, Chef. And yeah, and as you have already said, um, our aim was to give a first guidance on how to deal with blockchain smart contracts from a legal point of view, and also to give some guidance for, for practice. And I'm, I'm really also thrilled that we have uh, so, so uh, many people also on the, on the panel today that can share their views on whether this, this, these principles fulfill our aim and, and give some guidance to practice as well. Um, and maybe as a starting point for, for some uh, of you, um, 
that maybe have not yet been uh, involved uh, in, in blockchain smart contracts back then. Um, why did we start with the project or why did the project start as such? Um, if you as a lawyer, for example, um, hear the term smart contract, a lot of lawyers would in a first uh, view or in a first instinct uh, ask the question whether this smart contract is a contract in a civil law sense. And that is also, uh, or that was also the starting point of this project, or one of the starting points of this project, because uh, it was the aim to determine whether such program code um, can constitute a legally binding declaration, or whether whether such um, whether people can express uh, their will via such smart contracts. And uh, maybe just to, to briefly touch upon what is a smart contract. Um, you can see here um, uh, the, the, uh, an example of a coding uh, and a coding example of a smart contract that basically outlines a smart contract is nothing more than an if else or if then condition, meaning that if you have uh, one, you, you uh, specify a condition in the smart contract, uh, and then when this condition is met, uh, you, you trigger another event. And um, the question for our uh, for our project group was actually to determine whether this triggering of a transaction via a smart contract can uh, be can can be legally relevant, and that's uh, that's that's what we want to briefly discuss with you today. And and maybe a quick spoiler: we think yes, <laughs> uh, it can it can have a legally uh, uh, legally uh, can be legally relevant. Um, as Chef already outlined, we have the principles are structured in two big parts, the, the more general part that we will now briefly touch upon, and then the consumer principles that Jeff will explain in more detail. Um, what we, we were in constant discussions with, on the one hand, the European Commission, but on the other hand, also with, with uh, uh, crypto exchanges and other crypto players from the field to determine and to see what are the needs of the industry and what, what questions do they need to, to uh, have answered. And then we wanted to include them in our principles to give some guidance here. And this is also um, the, the goal of, of principle three and the explanatory notes there too, because we wanted to, no, and we wanted to outline um, uh, on the one hand that in a blockchain setting at this stage, there is no one fits all answer. We need to have a case specific approach um, uh, to determine which type of blockchain um, is used, for example, what legal impacts uh, this might have. Uh, and we know um, that, that there are there's, that there is not the blockchain technology and that there are different types of blockchain technologies. Um, but from a legal perspective, we, we found in the group um, that you can differentiate public and private blockchains that then can again have effects on uh, your, your legal assessment, for example, from a GDPR view or a, a regulatory view. So that is uh, one distinction that we wanted to make uh, at the beginning before jumping into uh, uh, other details and also focusing on smart contracts. The other key principle that I already briefly uh, discussed um, with, with, the, with the code example is um, whether smart contracts as such uh, can be legally binding. And we found that you have to, of course, analyze it on a case-by-case -case basis, but that in general, the triggering of transactions performed on a blockchain um, can amount to offer, acceptance, or any other contractual declaration if it is actually the intent of the parties, right? So you would have to assess uh, on a case-by-case -case basis if, for example, um, the coding of a smart contract and then the deployment of such smart contract on a blockchain could result in an offer being made from the, from the person um, deploying the smart contract uh, on, on a blockchain. And in our view, this could, for example, be the case if the smart contract determines the purchase object and the purchase price um, and this could then be triggered, um, for example, with, with, by, um, by sending a cryptocurrency amount to the smart contract. And uh, to give here an example, um, maybe build upon the example that Chef already outlined is, for example, NFT minting. You would here typically have a smart contract that issues those, um, those new tokens. Um, and those two tokens are issued once you um, send the predefined amount of cryptocurrency to such smart contract address. So in that case, this, this could, for example, be uh, a, legally, uh, a legally relevant action here 
with the with the smart contract, but of course um, has to be analyzed on a case by case basis. Um, building on this this very key element of our of our um, project group that we say um, yes, smart contracts can have somehow of a legal effect too. Uh, we differentiated different types of smart contracts, uh, mainly uh, to to sum them up into smart legal contracts uh, and transacting smart. Contracts. Smart legal contracts would be contracts in a civil law sense, uh, meaning they uh, or could be contracts in a civil law sense. Um, they could uh, really establish somehow of a, of a legally binding declaration of will of a um, of, of a person using the smart contract. Whereas transacting smart contracts uh, would only be mere code uh, and. There could be cases, for example, where no legal agreement exists and there is still um, a transacting smart contract, or where there is a legal agreement off chain, for example, and uh, it is only the smart contract is only a tool that is being used to execute the legal agreement off chain. So, in general, we, we could uh, differentiate these, these different types of smart contracts and use those uh, types of smart contracts to identify potentially. Uh, legal implications also when interacting with, with smart contracts. And uh, related to the question of whether smart contracts can be um, legally relevant, you would also need to address whether programming language, as we have seen in the, in the beginning, um, could be a contractual language. Um, and we uh, argue that this, is, uh, that this has to be differentiated on the one hand in a, in a B2B setting, um, we think that uh, it should be possible um, to agree upon between the two businesses uh, that the contractual language um, is the programming language, whereas in the P2C setting, this will most likely not be the case, or this will not be the case, um, and then consumers always have to be, um, the, the smart contracts have to be translated into natural language for consumers, but again, this, uh, this is going to be a, a part of the well, chef's a presentation. Uh, where we will learn more about how to deal with consumers in a, in a blockchain setting. Um, maybe just one last remark to conclude this general start, uh, general topic of, uh, of blockchain and smart contracts, because that is also something that we have seen in practice quite often over the last couple of months, um, whether it is possible to, to include arbitration agreements uh, within the commons of a smart contract, for example, and therefore have arbitration agreements um, uh, agreed upon uh, in, in case of a dispute. Um, and again, we would here argue that you have to differentiate between a B2B setting and a B2C setting, uh, but in a B2B setting, um, this, this should generally be possible. Um, again, of course, uh, taking into account the different, uh, yeah, the different national uh, specifics uh, of how to, for example, uh, Agree upon, uh, uh, agree upon an arbitration agreement. Um, but this is something that we also have seen in practice that, that um, is quite important for businesses uh, to have legal certainty here. And with that being said, maybe Chef, you uh, can, can build upon the, the consumer protection principles. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, as uh, you share the screen, could you please turn to the next slide, please? Of yeah. course. Thank you. Um, now, um, when we agreed that um, a transaction on a blockchain, which is which does not necessarily have to be a smart contract, but very often is, that a, that a transaction on a blockchain can be legally relevant. Of course, the question came up, well, that might be interesting for people who know what they are doing. Um, but what does this mean for consumers or for people who have no idea, in fact, how this technique works? And so we um, uh, already added that we felt that weaker parties, and we left open what exactly weaker parties were, that weaker parties should definitely be given protection in this environment, um, because it's an environment for specialists, for computer and uh, program developers. Um, uh, so that is what we had. But we then got the question, can you be more specific? Can you give an example of a weaker party? Particularly, can you show us how you think 
that consumers as being a, an, an important category of weaker parties can be protected. And so we added uh, principles on consumer protection to show that on the one hand, the general principles on the, uh, let's say that, that, a that, that the transaction on the blockchain can be legally relevant still work in the computer in a, um, a consumer setting, but that does not have to mean that the consumers are deprived of all their rights. Now, on the contrary, uh, we said, well, given that a transaction on a blockchain can be legally relevant, what does this mean for a consumer given the rights that the consumer has outside a blockchain, off chain? And so our general starting point was what you see here in principle 13, that consumer protection cannot be overridden by smart contracts or any transaction on a blockchain. In other words, if a consumer is entitled to protection off chain, so with a normal type of contract, a traditional contract, then the consumer has that same right on chain. The question then is how? How do you protect the consumer then on chain? So to give a consumer the same type of protection. Next slide, please, Martin. Um, so um, first of all, what we did is say, well, um, off-chain consumers are entitled to information, pre-contractual information. So how can this be done on-chain? And we then uh, let ourselves be inspired by uh, what in international financial law is called the key information document approach. That is, that if you buy a complex financial product, you need to be informed in simple, natural language on the essential characteristics of that product, its risks, and perhaps its advantages, but you have to be informed as to the basics. And what we said is, well, that should apply here as well, in case a smart contract is used in dealings with consumers, the consumer must understand, okay, this is a smart contract that is used. What does the smart contract do? What are the effects when I click on yes? And so on. Um, so consumers, as you can see here in principle 16, shall always have the same or functionally equivalent rights to information. It must be available off-chain in natural, plain, intelligible, and, a, and an understandable language. So a, a short document uh, drafted in highly specific technical language is not enough. And in case the document, the explanation of what the smart contract has for a fact, if the document deviates from the terms and conditions uh, uh, upon which the, the contract has been concluded, it's the document that governs, not the smart contract. Okay, next slide, please, Martin. Um, then our next problem was, well, uh, in consumer law, consumers very often are entitled to a cooling off period. And then we realized that, in fact, there are two types of cooling off periods. There is a period of reflection where there is no contract yet, but you get time to reflect. There is a binding offer, but the consumer is free to say yes or no, but the offer is binding for a particular period of time. And that is particularly the case with uh, mortgage offers, mortgage loans. Uh, but there is also the cooling off period when there is a contract, but the consumer can say, well, with hindsight, this is not what I want. I want the contract to terminate. Well, both rights we felt have to be as effective on chain as off chain. And here we introduced a duty to code. Now, that can be debated. Can the law uh, impose a duty to code? But we felt the answer should clearly be yes. So it has to be coded into the smart contract that, for instance, a consumer is entitled to a reflection period so that the smart contract will not run immediately, but only run upon the passing of the reflection period. But also, if the consumer says, I want the contract to be terminated, that this, as a result of the smart contract itself, results in a reversion of the transaction. Next slide, please, Martin. Um, so here you see that when 
a consumer uses a right of withdrawal, the, the exercise of that right should by itself result in a reverse transaction. And what a reverse transaction is, we define in the beginning of the principles where we give definitions which are of a mixed technological and legal nature. Okay, next slide, please, Martin. Um, what we also did is um, uh, looking at, let's say, the, the core aspect of consumer protection, which is the unfair terms directive. Now, the unfair terms directive protects consumers against terms which are unfair. Um, and how should that work uh, on chain? Well, we included here also duties to code, and I was a little bit too quick, Martin, so thank you for turning, turning back. Uh, we also here uh, introduced duties to code um, in that um, uh, if a particular uh, clause in a smart contract is considered to be unfair, this, has, this implies that the smart contract has to be recoded so that the smart contract is in conformity with what a consumer is entitled to. But also that if, for instance, a court decides that a particular clause is unfair more generally, that the smart contract as such is recoded. So not just in this specific case, but the whole smart contract. So what we did in the consumer part is say, okay, we accept that the transaction on a blockchain can be legally relevant. We understand that certain parties, particularly consumers, might fall victim to what is happening because they do not really understand what is going on technologically. So we should protect consumers. And how did we do that? By saying, well, your protection on-chain is the same as off-chain. And when it comes to information, you have to be given clear, concise, information in the form of what the financial law is called the key information document, plus we introduced duties to recode. I think those are the two innovations that we present. Um, I think this wraps up the uh, presentation of the principles. Um, and uh, Pascal, the floor is back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chef. Thank you very much to Martin Hansel and Chef Van Heer for this very clear uh, a survey, so to say, uh, and summary of these principles or most salient aspect of these principles. We will have now the pleasure to listen to Dr. Lucas Repa. He is a senior policy officer of the European Commission's DG Connect, uh, a lawyer by training. Uh, he has also been uh, to UC Berkeley at some point doing an LLM and some research on how fintech changes finance. So he's a specialist, both of the financial services, but also on the fintech. And of course, the, uh, uh, the, these aspects are central for, <clears throat> for the uh, blockchain technology and and uh, uh, the smart contract in, in general. And he, uh, he will, uh, as a project manager of, uh, and head of the legal team for files related to uh, DLTs and FinTech, he will uh, give us an update from the European Commission's uh, on what is going on uh, at the EU uh, level, but also uh, a feedback on ELI's principles and everything in 10 minutes. So of course, it's uh, quite difficult, but I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to give him the floor. You're still muted, sorry. Thank you for uh, for inviting me to to this very interesting workshop and to commenting on the Eli principles. I'm humbled by this this opportunity. Um, I've been uh, working with colleagues indeed on on the question of blockchain and smart contract uh, legal issues over the last years. And we have been asking ourselves a couple of the same questions that you have, I think, very effectively addressed in the in the Eli principles. I think both on the question, the very preliminary question, which Martin touched upon, when does 
a contract really qualifies a legal contract. A smart contract in the technical sense is not necessarily a legal contract in the first place. I think this distinction that you showed, Martin, is very, very helpful and very instructive to say only actually a small fraction of what software is out there and that is called a smart contract actually qualifies in a legal sense as a smart legal contract. And I think we also we also gave some thought about um, the application of consumer uh, protection rules, in particular the right of withdrawal that the chef has, uh, I think, very helpfully set out. And I noted with great interest the, uh, the suggestion of a duty to code. And um, perhaps um, I can then set out in a few words also how our reflections about a duty to court uh, could lead to further, uh, further steps. So uh, very briefly, the European Commission already three years ago started to look into the question of, do we need to adapt civil law in order to allow um, software to assume the status of a legally enforceable contract. We asked us this question three, four years ago already, and we did some preliminary research and we came to the conclusion that essentially under continental European laws, um, the common principles that regulate the coming into existence of contractual agreements are uh, sufficiently clear and sufficiently technology neutral. Uh, to apply them also to software. And as you said, uh, I think Martin in the, in the beginning, um, for there to be a, a legally binding contract and for software to be a legal contract, there has to be a meeting of minds on things people can understand. So as a very starting point, and you showed this, this impressive slide of the code, if you show this to a person in the street and say, do you understand what is being sold to you? I have my doubts that anybody would understand what's on offer here. So already this threshold would not be taken by most of the software that's out there. So already the question whether there is a legal contract with a very commonsensical approach to this is, is a no. We've then uh, asked ourselves, well, where are these hypothetical situations where at the retail level, uh, the household customer, smart contracts could really become uh, relevant. And up to today, we haven't really found good examples where consumers have been confronted with the question, is this now a contract that I'm agreeing to or not? This is just software. What we find in practice and going back to the examples also, I think that have been mentioned before, the use of smart contracts in finance, the use of smart contracts for cryptocurrencies, the use of smart contracts in crypto asset trading is that typically the consumer would be confronted with an offer to purchase crypto assets in plain language on a website. There would be an offer, a white paper explaining what the crypto asset is about, and the consumer would read that and would make a more or less meaningful judgment about whether it's worthwhile to purchase this crypto asset. And then the that smart contract would typically kick in in the background. They wouldn't even see the software. The software is there to execute. This is the second category of examples that you mentioned, Martin, about this more uh, think, transactional kind of smart contract. So what we see in practice is a lot of transactional smart contracts. We don't see uh, good examples for what you call the smart legal contracts in a narrow sense, simply because people don't understand the software and they wouldn't purchase something they don't understand. And people who want to sell something want to make sure that their offer is plainly understood. So they necessarily end up with, with plain language. Um, so, after a year of iteration, we concluded that at least at the state of the information we had, it was necessary to take immediate action and to propose civil laws that would create a specific status of a smart legal contract because we, we agreed that the principles out there uh, on the conclusion of agreements are sufficiently clear and it's a case by case assessment. And essentially this is I think what the Eli principles also say, you have to look at it case by case. Now, turning to the second part of the Eli principles, um, uh, what what Chef has set out, I think, is again very commonsensical. We can agree with uh, with what has been said there. I mean, obviously, software. There's no reason why software should derogate from compulsory compulsory consumer protection standards. 
and that is not what policymakers would like to see and it is it is not uh, it is not intended in any way to to lower the level of consumer protection rights by means of using software for the conclusion of contracts and actually at the time uh, that e-commerce started at the beginning at the turn of this this millennium in 2001 2000 when my predecessors drafted um, the legislative framework for emails to constitute a legal basis for concluding contracts in e-commerce, they came up with very sensical technology neutral principles which were enshrined in a directive, uh, the, the consumer, uh, the protection of consumers directive in distance contracts. And essentially these principles apply until today and they're technology neutral and they're very commonsensical. These principles essentially say also that a consumer must receive uh, prior information, clear information in a documentable manner before concluding a contract online. And again, this brings us back to what can a consumer meaningfully understand? That standard has not been uh, derived, not been uh, done away with the emergence of smart contracts. So smart contracts are used for concluding agreements under Article 5 of this directive. Uh, the consumer must receive a clear intelligible information prior to the conclusion of the contract and then after the conclusion of the contract even on a durable medium so very important and i think the ELA principles are fully in line with what we thought is that um, this level of consumer protection it has been established in 2002 for e-commerce by email also applies one-to-one -to, -one to the conclusion of contracts by means of uh, of, of distributed ledger technologies and and and, and time-locked hashed contracts which are called smart contracts um i would i would like to add perhaps one one footnote to uh the very interesting um, uh, principles that you've set out is when it comes to the right of withdrawal um, in under consumer protections laws, the recent markets in crypto assets regulation will create a lex specialis uh, because obviously, and you've said this, Jeff, also in, in a context, in a specific context uh, where uh, the nature of the contract is not conducive to right of withdrawal. We already have this in the existing legislation that right of withdrawal cannot be exercised. And one area where this is quite obvious is the trading of crypto assets and cryptocurrency exchanges. If you had a seven days cooling off period to reflect on whether you want to keep the contract in life or not, I mean, speculation would obviously be very easy. You just look at how the price of the crypto asset develops. And if it goes down, you just pull the trigger and you reverse the contract. So obviously that can't work. And the crypto and assets regulation will clearly say that. Um, the right of withdrawal for consumers only applies in the sign-up period until the crypto asset trades for the first time on exchange, and then that right of withdrawal obviously can no longer be exercised. Uh, finally, perhaps turning to my, a third, a third the cluster of remarks I would like to make, if you allow me, is just to update you a little bit on the legislative initiatives we have in the pipeline. So we have um, two legislative proposals in this in this uh, area. One is um, on uh, harmonizing the, the basic concept of what is a electronic ledger that is trustworthy for the purpose of recording data. And that is also relevant for the recording of data from smart contracts and contractual data. Uh, this you will find in a new section, Article 45H, of the new EIDAS regulation. The Commission has proposed a, a new proposal to revamp the EIDAS regulation. It will be called the Regulation on European Digital Identity. It's a trust service for operating electronic ledgers, which sets certain minimum requirements for qualified electronic ledgers. And one provision that's in there, which is very important, is it will say explicitly that an electronic ledger shall not be denied legal effect and admissibility as evidence in legal proceedings solely on the ground that it is in electronic form. So I think this, this matches something that you have in your ELI principles to say you cannot just reject uh, a smart legal contract as, as establishing proof for there to be a contractual agreement simply because it has been recorded on a distributed ledger. So you will find that ELI principle now in Article 45H, Paragraph 1 of the proposal for the IDAS regulation. Um, then second piece of legislation that you may also want to look at, which is also interesting, is the new uh, proposal for the Data Act, which contains 
uh, a definition of the concept of smart contracts in the Data Act in, in Article 2, Paragraph 16. And you will find a whole section on, on smart contracts starting from Article 30 of the Data Act, where we set out a number of essential requirements for uh, smart contracts to be used for data sharing agreements. And essentially these principles that has been specifically written for smart contracts for data sharing are quite commonsensical and could as well be applied to a broader context outside of data sharing. Uh, the smart contract has to be robust. It has to allow for the safe termination and interruption of the execution if there's a problem with the code. Uh, there has to be possibility for data archiving for evidentiary purposes and uh, there have to be access control mechanisms. So quite commonsensical principles that bind the developer of uh, smart contracts and the vendor of smart contracts uh, to comply with the standard, to auto certify the compliance with the standard. And the commission has a possibility to further specify this with uh, harmonized standards. So these are the two pieces of legislation in our pipeline, the proposal for the new EADAS regulation proposal for um, the Data Act, which will specifically legislate on smart contracts. Um, at the moment, no proposal under civil law under Article 114, because we believe at this stage uh, of our knowledge, we believe that the, uh, the current civil law principles in continental European law are sufficiently technology neutral, are sufficiently clear for judges to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether software represents a legally binding agreement, how that agreement has to be interpreted. And there's obviously no intention to lower the protection of consumer protection standards in Europe, simply because we can now embed software in blockchains and execute them automatically. So that's very briefly from Brussels, uh, a take on your ELI principles. I think they're well written, they're very clear, they're in line with our thinking, and uh, they say a lot of things that we are thinking very clearly on plain text. So I think that's certainly a step forward and uh, congratulations to your work. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Repa, for this uh, very clear also uh, assessment and, and also for giving us the, uh, the next steps uh, on, on side of the uh, European Commission in this regard. Uh, we will now uh, have the pleasure to uh, listen to Tamara uh, Rubey from Coin, uh, Coin Panion, sorry, from Companion. And uh, uh, she's also a lawyer uh, and, and she worked on a project with, uh, regarding the payment services directive to at the Research Center for European Legal Development and Private Law Reform uh, with Professor Welser. And after that, she worked also for payment services, uh, payment services in Austria an Austrian payment service provider. And thanks to all this understanding, I wanted to say she became head of legal uh, uh, at uh, Coin Pinion. And so again, we are on the verge between smart contract and, and uh, cryptocurrencies and payment, because in a smart contract, if there's no payment done, then you wonder why uh, conclude a smart contract. And that's why I think uh, Tamara uh, uh, Rabi, uh, no, Rubey, uh, sorry, uh, presentation will be of high interest. You have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And also thank you from my side for the great presentation of the ELI principles on blockchain, smart contracts, and consumer protection. These principles are indeed very much needed by practice because they answer a lot of questions or give guidance for questions that we have already discussed both internally and also with outside counsel. So before I start with my remarks, congratulations to the whole team and also thank you from Companion speaking for the practice. So now I would like to briefly comment on a few aspects of the principles. First of all, regarding the legal nature of smart contracts, in your principle five, you outlined the triggering of transactions performed on a blockchain may amount to an offer acceptance or a contractual declaration. In case some of the audience have not been too involved with blockchain technology or the crypto field as such in practice, this principle might seem obvious. However, in practice, this was really something that has been debated heavily, as I remember that Martin and I wrote an article on this question for, uh, this question four years ago that really resulted in heavy debates in legal literature because some argued that code can never be a contract in a civil law sense. So again, thank you very much for clarifying this in your principles as this really helps in practice, maybe not directly in case if 
we as a service provider interact with our customers because in such case we would typically have terms and conditions that we agree upon with the customers. But in case service providers decide to opt for new products involving decentralized exchanges with which there might not be written contracts because everything happens on chain and fully automated. So for these cases, cases, it is really important to know that these transactions can also trigger legally binding declarations. Um, and another thing that I would like to briefly comment on is, uh, which was already mentioned, is your focus on consumer protection, which I really fully support as it is necessary to show that consumer protection will also be upheld in the context of new technologies such as blockchain. In some cases, however, after just having a quick run through the principles, I'm not quite sure if I understand them correctly. And I would be very glad if you could further elaborate. So principle 17, which outlines a duty to code for a smart contract, example given with respect to a right of withdrawal. Um, so is principle 17 to be read in a way that says that whenever there is a right of withdrawal, it has to be coded into the contract or does every smart contract in every case has to include a right of withdrawal? So with a concrete example, to my understanding, the European Commission has now published um, a proposal to amend the consumer directives, stating that the right of withdrawal shall not apply when buying crypto, which was already mentioned. So how does this affect your duty of code and how can such smart contracts interact with changes? So example given when the law changes and the right of withdrawal is no longer required or is required as of now. So does it have to be updated or can it just be switched off? So I would <laughs> like to ask the panel or maybe Martin, uh, what do you think about that? Tamara, sorry. <clears throat> maybe uh, he will answer or they will answer all in, in a bunch. And, and so you could uh, continue uh, if you have further questions if uh, or further points to address. Otherwise, otherwise it would be that for my side for now. Okay, so thank you very much. And and, and then I think uh, indeed the ball is in uh, Martin's and Chef's field. So I don't know which one wants to answer that specific question, whether in a way it's pre or post uh, event that the uh, coding has to be applied and how that looks like and whether it's compatible with the uh, uh, pr proposal in the new co uh, consumer directive. And maybe afterwards, I would ask Lucas Repa also to react to that. Maybe, maybe I could uh, start, Pascal, um, uh, focusing on uh, principle 17. Now, first of all, in the explanation, um, we also made it clear that, well, who is a consumer in a coded environment is not as simple as it seems. Because a consumer, let's say a person in one situation can be a consumer but could be a trader in another situation. So when you talk about cryptocurrencies, uh, a consumer who trades in cryptocurrencies um, is in fact a trader um, for the purposes of that particular transaction. Um, at the same time, you could be a consumer using blockchain, smart contracts in different contexts. Uh, and this is why we've been really careful uh, as to uh, well, basically avoiding the definition of who is a consumer. So I wanted to explain that that is an, basically an open concept in a coded environment, a very case specific as well. And I understand for instance, that in Dutch case law, um, we already have cases where courts have to decide whether someone who normally would be a consumer, a natural person not acting within your uh, profession, whether that person in this specific situation is in fact a professional. So it's, it's not as clear as it might, might seem. Also what principle 17 does not want to do is imply a duty to code in any smart contract. It's if there is um, a right to a cooling off period that you have off chain. So without the use of blockchain technology and smart contracts, if you have that right off chain, you should have it on chain and should be coded into the contract. And of course, if the law then changes, then of course the coding of the smart contract has to change. The smart contract has to be updated. 
the same as the example I gave that a court decides that a particular term is unfair in let's say proceedings started in a class action then of course this smart contract also has to be updated so it's not that we say that any smart contract should have a clause that uh let's say reversal or whatever is is possible um that would go way too far it would not be necessary for us to say so we only say the other way if you have the right of withdrawal off chain you have it on chain it has to be coded into the smart contract because the user of the smart contract should not be allowed to say well sorry a smart contract is final this is it because that is what the technology is all about that would be a direct violation of consumer rights which i think would not be acceptable but Pep martin you would like to add something thank you i think you you, you already mentioned the most important things maybe just one 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 small remark, and the thing that, that Jeff already said and um, that you also touched upon, uh, Tamara, is um, what to do when the, when the law changes, right? And that is something that is, that is really difficult also uh, when, talking, uh, when talking about it in the blockchain context, because as the blockchain or distributed ledger as such, uh, it is hard to change something being deployed on, on the blockchain. You would have to work with probably um, technical aspects such as updated uh, smart contracts that can be updated because on, on, on some blockchains this is possible. And if not, you would really have to work in a way um, that, for example, you can uh, somehow you said it switch off or uh, a kill. That's what they say. Also kill the smart contract that it can no longer be addressed. And then an updated version of the smart contract would have to be deployed. But I, I think to actually cover existing consumer protection law, you would have to have some kind of, of, of possibilities to change a smart contract also already once once deployed. So um, I, th I think that that really uh, has to be done. But again, also what, what Lucas Leipa already said, in, in a very much cases, um, we will find uh, smart legal contracts and not in the B2C setting because no one would actually understand it. And so that this would, in, in those cases, the, the smart contracts being used are very often uh, uh, just transacting smart contracts. Um, whereas in a B2B setting, we have seen in, in practice some of the um, 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 cases where we really have, uh, well, where, those, where the smart contracts could have a legal effect. And in those cases, this could be interesting in the next uh, few, few years or weeks or months because the crypto sector is always moving fast. Um, uh, what, what, uh, what more examples we will have there? Because I think you also mentioned it, Tamara. Um, when in, when when interacting with decentralized exchanges, there is very often no written agreement as such, but just a smart contract um, outlining and on how you can exchange, for example, uh, different cryptocurrencies. And, and a lot of brokers use decentralized exchanges to um, to get the cryptocurrencies they need in order to sell it to their customers. So I think that that could be something. Can, could be a use case for, for smart legal contracts and also uh, quite interesting to have a close look at uh, how, how these developments go. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Chef. And of course, what you underline, and I will give the floor to, uh, to Lucas Repa, what you underline uh, uh, as a consumer not being always a consumer, and we have all these issues with so-called prosumers, uh, these consumers having contract with other consumers, but almost in a professional way, but not totally in a professional way. These are, uh, of course, issues that we find not only on the uh, on-chain uh, world, uh, because uh, you might conclude one contract as uh, and being co uh, defined as a consumer because you fulfill the uh, definition uh, given by a specific directive and, and then do another uh, type of transaction where you do not fulfill uh, the um, requirements. Also, sometimes because you have mixed usages, for instance, and the balance between the type of usages may change and may, may change your, your situation. So I'm, I'm wondering whether in the revision of the consumer directive, these aspects are taking into account and and what you said also is probably essential it's not because one uses the uh, uh the uh, um, dlt technology that one has a right to withdraw from the contract uh, 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 because everything is technologically 
uh, neutral or, or thought in a uh, neutral, te technologically neutral way, uh, there will not be like for distant countries for instance, a systematic right to withdraw. But I, I wonder how uh, Dr. Repa wants to, uh, to react also to these type of questions, because in the Q&R, which is still open, of course, you can continue to ask questions. Uh, there were a number of questions linked to the definition of consumer, but also how to withdraw from a contract when a blockchain is said to be uh, um, uh, unchangeable, but of course I understand one would write a new block and 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 not override the previous one, but have a, a new coding and add uh, addition of coding. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Dr. Repa, you can react right. whatever you want to say. Of course, I, I thank you for giving me. I think that will be my last uh, intervention, fortunately, because I have another meeting starting in in four minutes. <laughs> this is the new normal of one meeting after the other. So I think, obviously, if if something goes wrong and the judge orders a transaction to be reversed, the smart contract, that's the typical element of the smart contract, is embedded in a block and a blockchain, and the blockchain cannot retrospectively be changed, as Professor Pichinas has pointed out. So the question that arises, how can we work around this technical constraint while still giving the consumer the possibility to get the money back, essentially? This is what it's about. And if I read the, the principles, the Eli principle number 17, I think it's it's quite well written. It, it does say that, first of all, if it's possible to code the smart contract in the first place with the cooling off period involved, then you shall do that. So take the initial coin offering, Consumers subscribe to buy crypto assets, they get a seven days cooling off period before the contract comes into force. What would happen is that the, uh, the, the smart contract would only transfer the asset seven days after the consumer has clicked on I want to purchase. So there's just a delay element. It could be programmed into the smart contract. The more difficult situation arises the re with the retrospective, uh, retrospective change. So the contract has been concluded, the asset has been transferred, the consumer feels that has been fraudulent, we've been, the white paper was not clear enough, I bought the crypto asset with something completely different in mind, I want my money back, and the judge says, yes, he's right, he should get his money back. I mean, then you have basically the reverse transaction. You just exchange the asset back, you send it back to the, the address on the blockchain where it came from, and then uh, the tokenized asset, the, the cash lag is being transferred back, while the contract would still be there and could still continue to operate, right? Um, then you have the third instance where a contract is badly coded and it creates havoc. And that's the situation where we need to have a kill switch. And this is why in our legislative proposal in Article 30, of the Data Act, we say that for smart contracts to be safe, uh, they have to have an interruption capability. So as a vendor of smart contracts, you must program the smart contract in a way that it can be stopped. This doesn't mean that the whole blockchain has to be retrospectively changed, but it just means that the software, the code is a kill switch. And typically how this works is that it's not just one person that can stop the contract, but you need to have a multi-signature approach, several parties signing that the contract has to be stopped and then it is deactivated on the blockchain. So I think that the Eli principles are commonsensical. Article 17th principle for what I've, I've read is, 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 is applies very commonsensical principles saying that you can also reverse the transaction by sending it back. You don't need to change the blockchain. I think the one element that one could add going forward is then this kill switch functionality, which we're introducing in Article 30 of the Data Act, uh, because there should be a possibility to stop a smart contract. It just doesn't do what it is intended to do, or it has been hacked and, and harms consumers because of the hack. Uh, so there should be a, a possibility to stop it. So this is my two cents and uh, let me again thank you for having me and I have to apologize, but 
uh, I do have to go to another meeting right away. <laughs> so I wish you a good continuation of, of the discussion. And thank you very much for having the commission also uh, present thank you. today. And yeah, and thank you very much for accepting despite a very tight uh, agenda and for being here. That was very enlightful. I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you very um, much. And let you go. And and uh, and now we can continue the uh, discussion. We have further Q and A and questions uh, that popped up. Uh, um, um, one question was indirectly, and maybe I can go up again the list of questions we have. Uh, uh, one was indirectly being uh, answered, I think, about how fraud with such trans actions can be combated and 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 uh, the kill switch would exactly be the killer answer so to say to uh, this is too but uh, that was not directly uh, uh, i think the focus of the uh, principles though uh, if one thinks of fraud in the contract in the con conclusion of the contract and not just hacking or this type of things then of course uh, we have also uh, an issue there. How uh, can uh, contracts be uh, terminated because of fraud or be because of mistake or be because of uh, other aspects of vitiated consent? Um, and, and here again, uh, the principles provide for a general perspective, I would say, but I, I give the floor to Martin or Chef who wants to answer that question. Well, as to um, uh, let's say to the the more traditional problems that might arise in contract formation, because the same answers can be given on chain as off chain. So, if there is mistake and a contract is terminated or is declared void because of fraud, uh, the same consequences off chain should happen as on chain. So if a court, for instance, would declare a contract to be void because of fraud, um, the court can order, let's say, for instance, the, um, the seller of cryptocurrencies to take care of a reverse transaction. And if that is impossible, a damages claim will have to follow. Uh, I think in that respect, uh, the, the answers that the law already gives can also be applied on, ch on chain. So I don't see, um, let's say, too many principled problems there. I see practical problems, right? When you order uh, the reversal of a transaction on a public blockchain, who is your counterparty? Uh, you need to know with whom you concluded the contract. But that is a more general problem with blockchains. Uh, we assume that there are parties, because basically we focus on smart contracts. Uh, between specific parties, um, uh, so then you know your counter counterparty. But of course, there are problems there in case of a public blockchain. I completely agree. agree. Um, what I should furthermore, I think, should point out is that it seems as if the discussion is focusing on uh, uh, dealing in cryptocurrencies. But as I said in my uh, opening remarks. Uh, blockchains, tokens, can also be used for very different purposes. And it is for this reason, um, again, I, I would like to, to stress that, that the ULC in the United States, or the organization responsible for uniform laws in the United States, uh, started a project on uh, tokenization of real estate. Um, and then you're no longer dealing with cryptocurrencies as representations of money, but you you, you talk about cryptocurrencies representing either rights or physical objects. And then also there are smart contracts that apply to dealings in these tokens. Um, so um, although cryptocurrencies are now, let's say, at the forefront in our minds when we talk about smart contracts, we should also realize that developments go on and they go on very quickly. But perhaps, Martin, you would, you would like to, to add here. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I fully agree with you that, that, that the basic principles um, of, of contract law, for example, can uh, can be uh, applied here as well. Uh, maybe maybe more on a practical note, and uh, Tamara, feel free to to fill in if you want to add something on a on a from from a. Uh, from your point of view, a service provider. Um, what I understood is, for example, this because I, I 
get i think that this this question directed questions regarding fraud with also involving cryptocurrency and from a practical point of view uh, what what i understood here is that you would typically follow the, the trail of the cryptocurrency uh, cryptocurrencies because that is possible via blockchain explorers and you would follow the trail as long as you will find a service provider being being in the middle of of, of this trail right such as a, a crypto exchange for example and then you would contact this crypto exchange um uh to to stop any transaction to stop any 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 withdrawals for example and this could this is already in place with mere um cryptocurrency transactions and this could of course uh, also be be applied to smart contracts and, and fraudulent transactions on smart contracts and the results out of those fraudulent transactions. So I think that, that we could also use this, this principle that is, or this, this, this practice that we have actually also to, to these events, um, at least uh, this, this would be my take, but yeah. Again. Yes, thank you, and and I will I will give the floor to Tamara uh, in a second. Uh, what you have said just reminded me that in some legal systems, and I do not want to mention Swiss law, but uh, I, I'm thinking, of course, also uh, of Swiss law. Uh, when one thinks of, uh, for instance, a mistake or, or fraud, there are controversies whether the contract ever existed and was terminated, uh, uh, the, whether there is avoidance or whether the contract is void. And of course, uh, the consequence at the end of the day is the same. You will have to reverse to get the, uh, the final amount, but the underlying principles, legal principles might differ and the question of uh, period of limitation might differ and so on. And of course, uh, the uh, practical aspect might be similar, but the coding it might need to be different depending whether you have a longer or shorter period of limitation, depending where that period of limitation for reversing begins. And, and, and that being said, I, I just want to stress that, of course, the applicable law to the uh, blockchain or to the uh, um, uh, smart contract might have an impact on how uh, uh, dogmatically things are structured and maybe also how it has been coded because it has been coded with some pre-understanding of a dogmatical frame, which might not, I mean, the coder might not necessarily code with the correct uh, legal system in mind uh, because he might come from a different legal system or thought of different things. Uh, and, and therefore here, there might also be a, a, the necessity to ensure that what has been coded in fact reflects uh, uh, the uh, dogmatic underlying system that uh, uh, prevails on a specific smart contract. And I suppose that here, the uh, tracing that you were mentioning may play a role uh, on a different, um, level as well, for instance, for unjustified enrichment with three parties, some system have uh, uh, the need of uh, following uh, various uh, actors, you know, you go through uh, the various contracts and some others would allow a more direct action from one, from the last one, for instance, to the first one who might uh, be enriched from uh, some uh, uh, transactions that have been terminated because of, let's say, fraud or mistake or whatever. And, and here again, how do you find the proper uh, party? And, and that's probably uh, one of, uh, uh, or at least an additional difficulty when one is in the, uh, uh, in the blockchain uh, environment. Or at least that's what I would think, but Tamara, Ruby uh, might think uh, differently or might tell us, no, no, you, you don't know about the, uh, wh what we can do in practice. And I'm thrilled to see you. Uh, thank you. So speaking from the practical side, maybe it's good to know that uh, all kinds of service providers in the crypto space have to comply with uh, know your customer requirements. So there should be some kind of trace to follow when as long as the, the money or the crypto assets are on the platform or uh, are not, uh, there, there hasn't been a withdrawal yet. So I think as long as uh, service provider are involved, there's, there should be still a chance to, uh, to, to, to solve the fraud or get the money back. 
and this even with e-wallet and, and numbers. And so you would necessarily have to uh, send the money back to the same origin where it came from, independently of the fact that maybe the person has changed his or her uh, e-wallet or, or wants the money being sent to a different account. Would that be a difficulty from your practical perspective? I mean, I think as uh, when the money is withdrawn, um, there is probably no chance to get it back. But as long as it is not withdrawn, and if it, uh, you there has to be monitoring, and probably there would be a flag if in the transaction if if there was a fraud, or hopefully there would be. So the the withdrawal could have been uh, avoided. I see. So before the money is withdrawn everything is still possible afterwards, like in the real world, it might be much more difficult to get the money back, right? Yeah. Even, yeah, even electronically. Um, uh, we got uh, further questions and since we have some more time, I'm happy to, to go on. Um, um, one, one question that is more specific is uh, uh, the following, despite principle 2C, of the ELI principles, would it be possible to sustain the application of the relevant principles, for instance, principle 10, to a smart contract used as a tool to execute a legal agreement? And I think that goes back also to another question we had earlier in the uh, uh, flow of questions uh, with this difference between a smart legal contract and transacting uh, contract and 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 also what uh, was said about these smart contract running behind the scene in a way that they were not seen uh, in action so to say but they are there so may maybe martin you want to answer that question yeah uh, for sure i mean uh, maybe maybe just to, to bring upon a touch upon this uh, principle 2c uh, actually states that our principles focus on on smart legal contracts contracts uh, and uh, that this is the main object of, of the uh, the principles um, and um, so the question uh, is directed at whether also other the principles could also be applied to transacting smart contracts right and I, I think um, that a lot of those principles can also be uh, be applied to transacting smart contracts especially principle 10 because uh, it's it, for example, outlines that the un unwinding of a contract could be done by a reverse transaction. So meaning, uh, but th this means uh, that if you have, for example, a smart contract that um, that executed an off-chain agreement, uh, you would also have to un unwind somehow a reverse, have a reverse transaction to actually make sure that the person um, who lost money, for example, who did who paid money and, and didn't uh, receive anything in return, receives the money back. So this could could pro potentially also be done by a reverse transaction. So by by way of that, I think those those principles could be applied also to transacting smart contracts, smart contracts, um, and and they should also be, of course, um, yeah, consulted when when you have have uh, smart contracts uh, from that are only transacting because. I think, especially in the explanatory notes, uh, we always try to guide uh, through different scenarios that we also saw from practice. So there, there should be the one or other hint also for transacting smart contracts. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we have also a question on standard terms and, uh, and conditions. Uh, which says, uh, maybe I can read that out, is it enough just to explain the terms in standard terms and condition, uh, which are in standard terms and conditions, or does, does it uh, call for a separate contract for e in each cases? Uh, uh, so the question, uh, I understand it more uh, meaning, uh, can these standard terms and conditions really be standard terms and conditions? In, in, uh, in the way that you have terms that are used all the time and are referred to, or do you have to, uh, to code them into the contract all the time? And then the question is, are they still standard terms and conditions, in fact? Well, I don't know who wants, yes, yeah, Chef. Well, I think, yes, but basically the, this is more uh, <laughs> focusing on the consumer principles. I think this is the same type of question we have, let's say, off-chain as well. Um, so how how can you be bound by general terms and conditions? Um, 
the the use of this smart contract is meant uh, not just for one particular occasion. So it's meant for more than one occasion. So that would say that any term in a smart contract as a result would, I would say almost always, be a standard term because it's used in more than one particular case. But does that mean that all standard terms and conditions must be coded into the smart contract? No. Uh, a smart contract can contain a reference to standard terms and conditions available offline, for instance, or um, available online, but then they should be accessible by the consumer because then all the, the, the requirements that we now have for being bound to general terms and conditions must still be fulfilled. I understand that at the moment, at the Netherlands Supreme Court, a case is pending where um, a consumer got aware of general terms and conditions, but not in the way that the consumer was pointed out to those terms and conditions by the user. The consumer more or less by coincidence got information. Is that sufficient to have the consumer well, bound by those terms and conditions. And personally, I would say yes. So uh, I would say smart contracts, when they are used in more than one case, are general terms and conditions as a result of the, the definition as it is generally used. But it doesn't mean that all general terms and conditions have to be in a smart contract. So to, to give a reply to that. And if I may add, uh, Pascal, if you allow me, Yes, um, yes. To the complexities of contract law, um, as we all know, in some legal systems, contracts of sale automatically transfer ownership. And so if a contract is void or avoided in some legal systems, this has immediate proprietary effects. Uh, what we did in these principles is stay away from these questions, because that would bring us into questions of property law which from a private international law viewpoint makes it even more compl complicated than it already is. And um, if I may then also briefly connect with private international law in the principles, you see that in principle four, uh, we say uh, that the mere fact that uh, a blockchain on which a smart contract is stored is decentralized, uh, that as such doesn't make it an international transaction. So if, let's say, seller and buyer are in Austria, but the servers are, let's say, in Finland and in Turkey and perhaps in the United States, the fact that the technological flow of data passes through borders doesn't by itself make this an international transaction. Um, so I think that is relevant. That is what we also say. And also I should uh, that in principle 14 from the perspective of consumer law and if i may quote uh, that choice of law and choice of foreign clauses in smart contracts used by a business in dealing with the consumer are not to be given legal effect if a choice of law clause violates the rights of a consumer regarding the otherwise applicable law or the choice of foreign clause violates the right to sue or be sued before the courts of its country of habitual residence or domicile. So we included some very basic principles on private international law uh, to make sure, well, when is a case, in our view, not immediately international, so private international law doesn't immediately apply because it is a transaction on the blockchain, uh, however, if there is a choice of law and choice of foreign clause that violates the rights of consumers, those clauses are not effective. So thank you, thank very you for, much and, for, for and, allowing me to, to add this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, because what you mentioned about private international law makes me also relate to uh, what the European Law Institute has done for the uh, digital asset as security and also the uh, uh, the ALI ELI principles on data economy, where principles on uh, conflict of law rules and uh, on jurisdiction are set in a way that it is independent from the technology used. Because of course, as we know, with the um, DLT, you have a problem if you take the localization 
Of the data as a uh, as a specific element to to fix the applicable law or the jurisdiction, indeed, and and so there there is a, a certain uh, coherence. Uh, now, as to standard terms and conditions, uh, I, I think uh, one point is is also important to stress. That is, these uh, ELI principles uh, on smart contracts are not restricted to consumer contracts. And therefore, of course, what we say about consumers uh, uh, might not necessarily be applicable depending the law applicable for business to business uh, contracts. And, and, and there, of course, uh, you have also usually uh, the uh, duty to integrate the uh, standard terms and conditions into your contract, which means at least this integration clause need or might uh, need to be coded, but not necessarily, depending if you have a smart legal contract, so an offer acceptance that is outside the, um, the uh, that is off chain, because then it's the content of this agreement that might be sufficient to link the standard terms that lie somewhere, I don't know where, and, and, and are integrated into uh, the uh, contract. For a transacting smart contract to take uh, Martin's distinction, of course, it might be more difficult because if the contract uh, if the contract is a mere code, then of course you need to have a reference to uh, uh, um, terms that are also mere code. Well, a standard code maybe, but how to uh, everything needs then to be coded, and there we get to a more difficult uh, issue, which is of course. Uh, to know about uh, the standard terms and conditions and consider, consider that they need to be accessible or freely accessible in some jurisdiction, at least that's a requirement. And, and if you have a transaction only on, on chain, then maybe that might be a difficulty uh, that I can see and which is implied in the question we had. But Martin, you wanted maybe to, to intervene on that. Exactly, I, I fully support what you said, uh, and I think the, the thing is that you would also have to have a look in, in, in practice um, how you would integrate in the smart contract, right? If, whether you would really code it into the smart contract, whether you would include it in a common of the smart contract with a link, for example, because uh, that is what we've seen in practice, especially um, with regard to NFTs that, that we already discussed today and with licensing agreements uh, to such NFTs. But when, when an artist wanted to uh, actually give a license to the NFT holder, uh, we tried to incorporate uh, this link to the license uh, in a comment of the smart contract, for example. But again, but this, this again is, uh, is a question of transparency, right? Whether this is actually agreed upon um, depends on whether uh, the other party actually could could see that there is a comment and a reference to the terms and conditions. And this, of course, uh, is, is different in a B2C setting uh, and in a B2B setting, because uh, this, this is, yeah, <laughs> as we all know, this changes a lot. So, so maybe just to give that also from, from a practical point of view again, because this is something that we, we have been discussing a lot when in, in the whole context of NFTs and, and the licensing agreements there. Yes, thank you very much, Martin, for these uh, uh, useful addition. Uh, I see uh, now two further questions. One is uh, a link to um, um, the uh, question whether there is a need of redrafting the smart contract when changes arise. And of course, now we, we, I don't want to speak about hardship and the need to renegotiate a contract and all this, but that might also be an issue. Uh, um, here it says, would it be better to have multiple dep depositories or accommodative entries on chain? In a way, have already all options open, and, and, and so it would make it, I don't know, easier in practice, instead of redrafting uh, post act the uh, smart contract, have a kind of all option smart contract, almost like a, a, a legal text which, uh, uh, you know, multiple entries and then you choose the uh, uh, the the good entries depending of uh, what happens in, in the uh, real life but then you need of course oracles in order to introduce that real life uh, events but i don't know tamara or martin who wants to 
to give uh, a perspective on, on that very uh, practical and technical and coding uh, perspective. Maybe, maybe for start. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that that's also something we, we discussed uh, with with, uh, with the in, in practice already with the client whether um, and how we can we can reflect it and when, uh, changes without having to uh, kill or re kill the, the smart contract and, and deploy a new one. Um, and what we understood from from the from from our uh, practical point of view was that uh, it is quite hard to actually. Um, have all the, all the possibilities at the, at the beginning uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and think of all the different options that, that you can code everything on chain already. And if you link uh, the, the smart contract for uh, certain aspects to something off uh, to something off chain, then we would again, that what you already said, Pascal, need an Oracle. And then we would need someone to actually make sure that this Oracle is up to date, works properly. And we would have another po uh, possibility for, for, for defects, for, for faults, Etc. So that is why we then uh, decided um, to go through, let's say, three possibilities that were quite likely in light of new uh, EU regulation, and uh, already deployed the uh, smart contract variations in those two, uh, in those, in those, um, reflecting those different laws, uh, and could then kind of uh, um, integrate, uh, uh, you know, make it go, make the smart contract go live, uh, which we, which, which one we needed. So that, that is what was our solution here. But um, to be honest, we were not super happy with the solution and no one was super happy with the solution. So we're still finding, uh, we're still trying to find a, a, the perfect solution for, for this case. Thank you for being, as you say, super honest. Uh, and uh, Tamara, Ruby. I think I have nothing to add because I don't have a practical experience with this concrete okay. question. So Martin said it all. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I still have uh, a couple of uh, seconds. So maybe there's a, yet another question linked to uh, the uh, private international law. Uh, Chef, you, you mentioned Article four, uh, Principle 4 uh, and, and, and the basic principles. Now there's a question saying, is that, does that deviate from the CIG, from the UN Convention, Vienna Convention on the International Sales of Goods, uh, 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 which defines what is the international character of a contract? Now, maybe before you answer, uh, one can say, oh, of of course, we have uh, many countries that have adopted the CSG, and so it's applicable, but it can also be excluded. So uh, even if it's, uh, it derogates, it depends, on, of course, what the parties have done in their own uh, contract about that. But if they have not excluded the CSG, then, of course, uh, the question might arise, is the international ca character of a contract set up by the CSG or by the principal? I have an answer, but I'm happy to give the floor to a chef because uh, you are on uh, on the panel now. Well, um, this particular problem uh, arising from the CIG is a bit of a minefield, as we all know. Um, uh, I know that um, CISG is creating grave problems here. And I think what we propose for DLT is just really very workable. So I would um, think that uh, our approach in principle four is, um, I would say, the, the most workable approach. But I'm very careful in replying, given what I said, that I know that this international characterization under the CISG really is a minefield. And it is sometimes forgotten. And then suddenly it comes up in case of a conflict. Uh, and then suddenly the CIG applies because it has not been excluded. Uh, so, um, Pascal, please allow me to be very careful. No, no. Uh, I, oh, yes, of course, I allow you to be uh, very careful here. But indeed, if one takes the seat or the re resi um, habitual residence of the parties as the triggering effect, uh, uh, then that's more or less Article 4 CIG. And we are in line, it seems to me, at first sight with Principle 4 as well, because uh, 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 the technology as such will not have an impact 
on uh, the seat of the parties to uh, the transaction. So I, I, I'm not sure there's really a contradiction here, but again, one would need to go into all the various hypotheses to, to be sure not to forget something. I see Martin uh, has uh, unmuted himself, so he might want to add something. Just one, one quick addition, uh, because uh, the background from uh, Prince before was also that it has been uh, debated in legal literature heavily whether uh, as the use of a smart contract as such will in any case um, establish an international perspective because uh, when using a public blockchain that is distributed among different countries that is uh, basically something that we wanted to clarify that we would still argue that in, this, in the context of a smart contract setting you would need to analyze on a case-by-case -case basis whether this smart contract would actually be an internet has an international character so just to give some background information why this is again uh, in our view an important principle mm. and with this we get uh, to uh, the end of the time that was allotted to our lunch winner. Uh, it is my duty and pleasure, of course, to thank now the, all the panelists and especially uh, uh, Chef Van Eyre, Martin Hansel as the uh, co-reporters uh, and, and, and chef chair of, of this project, but also Tamara Rube for being with us and giving also different insight on this project. I think Thanks also to all the participants. It has been uh, very interesting. Uh, this uh, uh, webinar will also be available on uh, YouTube and on, on the uh, web of the European Law Institute. So it will be possible to, to look also at the, uh, at the um, uh, PowerPoint that was presented to rethink about it at least and po potentially also download it. We, we will see uh, that later on. So thank you very much to all of you for those who were eating and listening, for those who were uh, speaking and hope now to eat. And I wish you a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you soon.